Welcome, 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 everyone. Hey, it's time. I've been promoting this for about three or four weeks now, and it is time. It is time. Sipping tea with Dr. V. Hey, sipping tea with Dr. V. The song that was on is better by Jessica Reedy. I think I, I just got a message that I'm looking a little blurry. Hopefully that's gonna clear up on Facebook. I don't see it on my end. Hopefully it will clear up on Facebook. Uh, we are here. My name is Reginald Lee Wilson. I am the founder and the CEO of Faith Steps Productions. Faith Steps is an acronym to mean forget all impossible thought hindrances as you start to enter prominent success. This ministry was birthed about 14, 15 years ago up under my mother's ministry, Innovative Agape Ministries. And we started doing uh, stage productions, church plays. We have the Rapture, Platinum Grill, Spirit Field, and now we're also producing Scrambled Eggs. I'm very honored right now to have my mother. Everyone knows that, and if you don't, now you know, I am my mama's boy. So I am very, very honored to be here with my mother as we speak on her book. I'm too old for that. This book is very, very powerful. I've read this book twice, and now I'm studying it. It, it has rejuvenated me in such a way that I'm almost upset that I put some of my projects down because I thought I was too old or I thought that it wouldn't come to fruition. Well, this book has really, really motivated me. So I'm going to pass the mic over to my mother for a brief moment so she can introduce herself, so she can tell you who she is. And after that, we're going to get right into it. I know some of you are waiting for some very juicy topics, and we are going to touch on those. Right now, we're going to give the mic over to Dr. V. Good afternoon. I'm so glad to be here uh, with our speaker today. And I'm getting a little sign that says my internet is a little shaky, so I hope everybody can see what was going on with me. But it's a pleasure to uh, serve here today with my son, Reginald, the actor, uh, Reggie, Reggie Lee. Uh, I am the mother of nine uh, children, all of them I love and enjoy. And I have a whole host of grandchildren, one of which I am the caretaker for right now, and I'm really enjoying little Josiah. It's a pleasure to serve today. I am employed at the Florida a University Developmental Research School as an associate professor. I do I hold a PhD, uh, a real one, a doctor of philosophy degree <laughs> out of Florida a University, uh, un uh, the university in the College of Education in the area of educational leadership. I am a published author. I am a motivational speaker, but my greatest accolades are that I am a parent. I love pastoring. I love writing, I love educating, but I love parenting more. That's me. All right. So that's 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 the very quick introduction for Dr. Vivian Wilson. Uh, I am very honored to have her as a mother. Uh, one thing uh, that I don't know if she spoke on, but she has nine children. And six of us have graduated from Florida Agricultural and Mechanical University either with an undergrad degree or a master's degree and or some both. I got my undergraduate degree from University from FAMU in 2008 
from the theater department. And then I actually went to the University of Florida and, and received my Master's of Fine Arts from there. So I am going to try to keep this as professional as possible. But to me, she's mama. So I will, sometimes I will, you know, say mama or something like that. But uh, this is called Sipping Tea with Dr. V. I hope you all have your tea. See, I got a big cup. You see the steam coming? I got a big cup because oh, there's a lot that we want to talk about. So we're going to, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, post them in the comments on Facebook. I have my phone down here as well with the Facebook Live on. So if you have any questions, Ricardo, Lewis, how you doing, brother? How you doing? Tia Nia, how you doing, fam? You, Arlene Magruder, Brian Milcher, just want to say hey to y'all as well. All right, so um, we're going to jump right into this. We're going to talk about the book, I'm Too Old for That. Uh, if you are experiencing some delays on your, on your feed, don't worry. This is recording, and after I go through and make some edits, we will be posting this as well. So just get ready, sit back. Sit back, relax, because now is the time. Hey, Auntie Jo Lunda, I see you joining us as well. So uh, everybody sit back. We're going to talk about the book, I'm Too Old for That. This is her fourth book, uh, the second book that is published, I believe. Uh, she has another book teaching G Gigi's children, and uh, that we're going to speak about that briefly as well. So, Dr. Wilson. Yes. Why? <laughs> what made you write this book? Uh, two, two reasons for writing this book. The one is right uh, about a couple of weeks before I wrote the book, I got invited to a church service by a dear friend of mine. And she had a bunch of women coming to speak. And my topic was, I'm too old for that. And I was mm -hmm. like, yes, that's a book title. And then I ended up um, being admitted in the hospital with an illness called Boop. And it's an illness that I had never heard of before and researcher. So I started researching that illness to see exactly what it was. And you know, looking back at that book today, I'm asking myself, was that COVID-19? Because it has a lot to do with the <laughs> Yeah, uh -huh. <laughs> I thought the same thing. <laughs> yes, because it has a lot of the same symptoms as COVID-19. And I'm a survivor. So, but it's called boop, and it's, they called it the beginning uh, phase of pneumonia, and that they were trying to make certain that didn't become into full-blown pneumonia. But as I was looking back at the book to prepare for today, I was like, man, these symptoms are very, very similar to COVID-19. And I'm just wondering how long that little book have been around uh, but anyway, and don't, so I'm in the hospital. Uh, I call for my laptop in the hospital. Let's bring me my laptop. I, I got to do some research to figure out what's going on with me. And in the midst of doing that research, I began to type this book. I'm too old for that. Just too I'm old. Too for. old for that. Yeah. So I just want everyone to, I just want everyone to catch on to that because I'm, 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 I'm going to try to pull out as many nuggets as I can. But it's so many nuggets. It's so exciting. So. She had an illness called uh, Boops, and Boops is, a, a, I don't know if I'm going to say all of these words right, but it's called bronchiolitis obliterans organizing pneumonia, and it's a, and it's a rare inflammatory lung disorder. So uh, like she said, it's something that was similar to COVID-19, and I know as I was reading, I was like, yo, this sounds just like COVID-19, but past that, past that, the fact that you were able to do this book <laughs> Y'all better follow me on this one. The fact that you were able to write this book after going through that experience, some people would have gave up. Some people would have stopped. Some people would have said, okay, okay, uh, let me lay down in this sick bed because I'm going to have to deal with this sickness. But you kept persevering and you came out with this book. I'm too old for that. And I know I've compared this to Napoleon Hill's uh, book, uh, think and Grow Rich. Uh, I've compared this to other manuals that people have written to motivate others. And I've also said that people may say that I'm being a little biased because you're my mother, but that's not it. This book is it. And 
We're going to talk about the chapters in the book. We're going to go through each chapter and we're going to speak briefly about it because I don't want to give all of the spoilers of the book, but I do want to give people a chance to go and purchase the book from amazon.com and, and have their own copy so they can write in it because this is not my workbook. I'm writing in this. I'm circling. I'm putting things in brackets. I'm underlining things triple times. Like, that's it. That's it. That's it. So it's, it's important because myself, I'll be 44 this year. And there's a, there, there's a part in this book where you talk about things that happened at the age of 44. And yes, uh, yes. some people will give up, give up at the age of 44 or the age of 40. And they will say, okay, I just need to uh, work on the things that I've already done. I, I don't need to try to, to do anything new because I'm at that age. That's not it. <laughs> that's not it. This book shows you that that's not it. Uh, Auntie Jolanda said, you're looking beautiful, Ma Dr. Wilson. Hey, doc hey, Auntie Jolanda. Thank you, thank you, thank you. How are you? I love you. I love you a lot. I love you a lot. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump right into the book. And jumping into the book, you know, there's a prelude where she talks about boots. She talks about all those different types of things. But then she gets to the forward. Once you get to the forward, <laughs> you have to read the forward about five times because the forward is so powerful. The forward has so many beautiful nuggets and elements in it that just make you want to just pick up everything that you've given up on. How long did it take you to write the forward? It seemed like it just flowed, like it just flowed, like it was a God-given talent that just flowed out of you. How long did it take you to write the forward? Actually, the entire book was written in about a week because I was just that passionate about it. The forward didn't take long because as I lay there in the hospital, I said to myself, as many times as God has healed me, as many times as I've, I've laid hand on people and they recovered, as many times as I've heard the testimonies of other people recovering, I'm too old to believe that he won't do it again. I'm right. too old to believe that I just lie here and die. I'm just too old for that. I'm too old. I have enough faith in God to believe he's going to see me through. He's not right. going to allow this to take me in because there are much, much, much stuff that I have to do in my life. So this boop is just one little hiccup in the road. I'm too old for that. I'm too old to just lie here and wait for doctors to come in and, and, pull, and probe and prod and stick and all that kind of stuff. I got to get up from here. So I kept speaking to myself because the scripture says, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. I couldn't stay there and have a pity party. I couldn't invite all those pity party goers. I had to step up and say, let's move this forward. Let's make this happen. I love it. I love it. I was reading the forward and one thing that caught me by surprise <laughs> is when you when you speak when you speak about your first graduation well your first your first uh degree bachelor's because you got your undergrad degree from i mean your your, your associate's degree from mm -hmm. tcc and then you went over to famu and you got your degree at the at the age of 37 yeah. and you graduated and i remember this i didn't know the depression that you felt after graduating, I didn't know that you cried for a, for a solid week after graduating. Yes. At a time that we were so proud as children, as your children, we were so proud. We were screaming. We were so happy. But you had this depression on the inside and you masked, you masked it so well. So let's talk about that for a little while. When I uh, attended college at a very old age, uh, to me, uh, I had about four or five kids at the time. As a matter of fact, by the time I graduated, I had all six of my first set of children. And uh, so I was in college with 21, 22, 18, 19 year old children, uh, little kids to me, and trying to compete with them in class. And I, I remember one time I specifically said to an eight year old who was a whippersnapper, what I would call him, what the older people used to call him, <laughs> always blurt out the answers and just give the answers. And I'm like, I haven't even heard the question yet. Allow me to at least hear the question. So I finally raised my hand and said, young man, you know, we appreciate that you know all the answers, but we all pay for this class. 
And I need to have the opportunity to at least hear the question so that I can know what you're answering. And the good part about it, he slowed down and everybody else in the class slowed down so that at least all of us in the class can hear the questions. I want you to know, needless to say, I did receive the A, but he did not. So maybe he slowed down a little bit too much. But the bottom line, I needed to hear it. And I, did, and I was not coming there to lose. I was coming there to win. I, I was in college to win it. So what made you go 35? Why? I mean, you were, you were pretty successful. I remember you at student government. I remember Daryl Jones. I remember Daryl Parks. I remember uh, Earl Oden, Policia Cook. I remember all of those names, all of those successful people. And I remember Daryl Parks, stand, attorney, Daryl Parks, standing in your office. I remember Daryl Jones, who's now on the school board, I remember him giving those jokes, and he was one of the funniest people I met. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I remember all of this, and I remember you helping everyone matriculate through school, get their degrees. I remember you motivating them. Even though I was a young child, I remember this. I remember it vividly. What made you say, all right, it's enough. Let me go get mine. One of those people who I was motivating um, came, I heard her make a statement outside of my office one day. Why do you all always go in there to Miss Wilson? I was not doctor at the time. Why do you always go to Miss Wilson? She's just a secretary. Now, these are people who I had written, uh, half written their papers for them, typed their papers, proofread their papers, made sure that they were graduating from college with their bachelor's degrees, their master's degrees, and some even with their PhDs, helping all of these people. And to hear that statement, she's just a secretary, then I knew that they didn't value my worthiness. So I had to prove that I was more than just a secretary. And um, uh, I took that. A lot of time, people throw those things at you. You got to be able to recognize that when they throw stones, you got to make it a step and step mm -hmm. over it and move forward and move to the direction that you needed to go. And I had to prove that I was just as smart as every student that had come through there or even smarter. And so my goal was go, go to college. And at that time when I started, I think I only had four children. Go to college. Let's get it going. Let's go in. Uh, I was working full time. I was doing the first lady thing in church and working on all the organizations at church and at school. I was doing all of that stuff, but I took the time because it was important to me to prove that I was more than just a secretary. But don't forget now, I still love being a secretary, yeah, yeah, yeah. but I'm more than just a secretary. So, so while you were doing the college and, the, and the, the associate's degree and the bachelor's degree, were you still doing the secretary work? Were you doing both? I did both? the secretary work only through the bachelor's degree, through okay. the AA and the bachelor's degree. And part of the no, not even part of the master's degree, because at that time, right after I received my bachelor's degree and in business ed, I was told that I would not find a job. I'm too old for that. I'm too old to hear negative things. So I said, nah, you know, I wouldn't, the Lord would not allow me to go four years uh, to receive a degree and there is no job. And right. just so happened when I graduated in April, I received a call in May that a teacher who had a business ed position, the only one in the city, uh, resigned. And, and I said, this is, this is my door. This is my door. I'm going to walk in it. I walked into the job interview and I did not walk in there saying I came to apply for this job. I walked in there and I said to Mr. Rick Williams, and I love him dearly, even today, I said to Mr. Rick Williams, who was the assistant principal at Griffin Middle School, I'm coming here today to get my job. Hey, so Auntie Marion, how you doing? I see Auntie, your, your sister is on as well as Jonathan Wilson, my brother. He's on as well. I don't know if he's going to join in because uh, we also were going to do two brothers and a mother, but I know he has some schoolwork to do. So that's why we, that's why we call it sipping tea with Dr. B. So just to recap, you went to, uh, you went to uh, TCC, you went to FAMU, you got your associates, you got your bachelors while having six children. Yes. And being the missionary of the church, all of these titles, and you still finished in four years. Yes. That's remarkable. That, that, that alone is remarkable. I mean, that's, that's motivation. That's nothing more than motivation. Now, to go on, because you didn't stop. 
two years later, you had your master's. Yes. And you didn't only <laughs> you didn't only have your master's, you finished with a 3.89 GPA. Yes. That has to be like all A's and maybe one B. Like, let's 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 talk about your master's program. And let's talk about that one B that you're talking about. I would <laughs> never, <laughs> I would never forget that one B. I can't remember the guy's name who gave me that one B, but I will never forget the cowboy boots that he wore in class every day. And he used to make a statement, you people. And my yeah. thing was, yeah, you people was very, very, to me was insulting. To me, mm -hmm. it was racist. It was all of the nine yards. And so I knew it was gonna be a struggle just to get that B. And I had to get a B, so I made certain that I did. But I could not get past the clinking of the boots every day, you know, in the classroom. And I believe that is the one B that I received during the master's program. Um, it was it was arduous, but I made it. Hey, y'all heard that word? She's gonna have to break it down for me a little later. I liked it a lot. <laughs> I know Auntie Joe London knows what it means, but whoo, arduous. How to say it again? <laughs> arduous. Arduous. I like it. I like it. I'm going to put that into my vocabulary. Now, so we're we're reaching the end of the forward. That's just the forward, y'all. That's just the forward. Uh, she ends the forward after she tells you all of that, all of those accolades, uh, uh, what she went through medically, uh, her associate's degree, her bachelor's degree, all the way to her master's degree, her first master's degree, and then she finishes the forward with the question too old for what <laughs> so i ask you right now all of all of my viewers everybody who's listening right now too old for what what are you too old for you're not too old which she just proved it to you right there dr v wilson and we haven't even got to the phd part of it yet but dr v wilson just proved to you right there too old for what and that's the way she goes into her first chapter and her first chapter is entitled, Too Old for What? Do you want to speak on too old for what before I go into some questions or you want me to go right into the questions? Go into the questions. All right, so she asked the questions in Too Old for What? What is keeping you from reaching your goals and things that you are destined to achieve? Take an inventory of where you are and where you need to be. Close your ears to the naysayers and those who really don't wish you well. I'm going to say that again. We're going to back that up because that's a problem that we have right there. We listen to too many people. Mm -hmm. We listen to the wrong people. We listen to the negativity. Close that negativity out. She says, close your ears to the naysayers and those who don't really wish you well. The sky is the limit to what you can have when you actually Put your mind and your prayers to it. Now, it calls some work. Now, the Bible says faith without works is dead. So she tells you to put your mind and your prayers to it. That's an action. That's something you have to do. Talk to us, Dr. V. How did you do it? You know, I have to... And, I, and I'm jumping ahead, so I may mention this again as, as we go along, but I have to go back and I say it right now. One thing my dad taught us uh, growing up, um, I had the best parents, I think, in, 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 in Gaston County and probably in most of Florida. But one thing my dad had taught us is resilience. And when I thought of that, and dad did, probably didn't know that word resilient. So he taught it to us in a different kind of way. He taught it to us by examples. He taught us how to get into situations and find a way out of them. You find a way. You don't just let life knock you down and you stay on the ground. You wiggle and you wiggle and you find a way to get yourself up. And I remember how dad solidified that resiliency with me when he was 75 years old, I went to his house and I was going through a tremendous uh, stress at that particular time. And I walked in his house to see him because he had been diagnosed with cancer. My dad, um, 75, I walked in the door and he looked at me and he said, Vivian, he said, you look really, really weak today. He said, you are losing your faith. And I'm already feeling depressed. He said, you are losing your faith. And this man, 75 years old, with cancer, said to me, 
I need you to borrow my faith for a week. I need you to take this faith with you and strengthen yourself. And he said, but you got to come back to me because you got to bring me my faith back because I needed to live. I had never heard in my entire life of a transference of faith, but I believed in my dad's ministry and I believe in my dad's God. And I remember that I believed in my dad's commitment to what he believed in that I walked out of that house that day. I cried from Quincy to Tallahassee because I had to take a man's faith that I knew he needed at that time to live. I had to take his faith because he saw the distressful look on my face. And in that one week, God grew me up so fast that all of the depressions and everything that I was going with was gone. I got back in my car a week afterward and drove back to my dad and said, here's your faith back. My dad recovered from the cancer. I recovered from the depression. So he taught me resiliency. Don't let it keep you down. He said, find a way to plow your way out of it. Find your way to get out of it. Start over again. Shake yourself off and let's move it and get it to the direction that it needs to be in. Hey Amen. I know that's I know that's that's something that uh, you even passed on to your children. Yes, we have we have experienced some hardships uh, in our own lives. Uh, I know uh, my divorce. You know it was hard. It was it was tough. And I, I know throughout my marriage, you were you were the coach, for lack of better words. And and and, and when things would come about that I didn't agree with you would coach me on and you would tell me, Reggie, you got to be stronger than that. You got to show, you got to show the faith. You got to show the world. So I, I, I really, uh, I'm, I'm almost getting emotional over here, but I, I'm really, really loving it. And I want to say hello to uh, your other sister has joined on Dr. Ola Kakalasha. All right. How you doing, Dr. Ola Kakalasha? Um, so uh, Auntie Marion wants you to know, <laughs> I'm getting emotional, sorry. Auntie Mary wants you to know that uh, granddad would be so proud of the woman that you are in spite of. And we're going to talk about that in spite of, too, just a little bit later. Uh, we're going to keep going on in the book to the next chapter because I don't want to give all of the meat. Uh, we're just going to give some skeletons and put a little meat on it. So the next chapter is called Too Old for Whom? Uh, that's a very important chapter for everyone. Everyone really needs to uh, uh, read that chapter because uh, uh, one thing my mom and my father used to say was picked out to be picked on. Yes. And it's a very important thing. You're picked out to be picked on. You're, you're very special. You have a gift. You have to walk in that gift, walk into your ministry. Uh, my mother in her book, in the chapter, she says, don't settle for something that is not yours. Absolutely. It's your turn. God has a blessing with your name on it. Don't go get somebody else's <laughs> and don't let somebody else grab yours. Now she didn't exactly. say that. I had that little piece to it. But <laughs> <laughs> she says, God has a blessing with your name on it. God will make windows where there are none. He will open doors that have been locked to you for a long time. And he will close the doors that have been an oppression to you. Someone shared to my mother a while back that it is scientifically impossible for a bumblebee to fly. <laughs> it's scientifically impossible because of the weight of the bumblebee and the size of the wings. But the bumblebee proved the scientists wrong. The bumblebee got out there and he flew. Just like you can do. Just like you can do. And you can do. And you can do. And you can do. Too old for whom? It's not too late to fly. Get out there. Shake those wings and watch your faith keep you off the ground. Come on, talk about it, Dr. V. A lot of times we, we settle. And that's a defeatist attitude to me. Don't settle for mediocrity when you can be grand. Um, stop saying, and, and I use that a lot with people who want to wear labels. I have this alphabet. I have that alphabet. I put that a, a lot with the people with labels. And I said, say to them, don't wear the label. Improve on the label. You can do more than you are acting or more than you think you can do when you put forth, forth the effort to get it done. I could have said, man, man, I, I was poor. There were 14 of us. 
Um, I didn't have this. I could have said, you know, McDonald's look good. I can go work there. Um, Burger King, I, I, I can do any of that. Um, there are so many things that I, I can do just to get a paycheck. But what is a paycheck and you're still homeless? Mm -hmm. what, is a, what is a paycheck and you can't buy a meal that will last until you get the next paycheck? So who are you too old for? No, no, who are you fooling? Um, why do you always have to have a handout? I've never really liked the handouts. I've never uh, gone after a person just because I need a sugar daddy. I need somebody to take care of my bills. Or I need somebody to do this, even when I did not have the degree because I put my trust in God. So who am I too old for? Who is, is to tell me that it can't be done? Because I know it can. I, I know that if I, if I put one foot ahead of the other and keep putting it there, I'm going to get to where I need to go. But if I stand still, I don't move. If I go backwards, I'm losing. So as long as I can put one foot ahead of the other one, baby steps until I can get to where I'm going, who's to tell me I can't do it? What's to tell me I can't do it? Even while we're here on COVID-19 quarantine, there are things we can do inside. I'm finished writing another book. So look for another book to come out. And this one will be domestically inclined. It's, it's, it's the Prayers for Hurting Women, the Domestic Violence uh, Edition. Because I want women and men both know, to know you don't have to stay there and get beat down, beat up. Uh, lose your eyes and lose all of that stuff. Uh, you can put one foot ahead of the other one and make it happen. Who are you sitting there just allowing things to happen to you when you don't have to? So you got to make it happen. Uh, even though, and I, and I may have mentioned in that book or one of the books, even though my mom and dad neither had um, a college degree and not, not either one of them had a high school degree, they never settled for us not having it. They never settled for a high school diploma to be enough for us. I remember when my oldest sister, Martha, uh, finished high school and I, I'm still, I'm 66 in a couple of months and i'm still trying to figure out where did she pay for her room and board i, I still haven't figured that out yet because i remember my dad going to get 90 dollars to pay for her tuition and i clearly don't believe 90 dollars would have taken care of tuition room board food and all that kind of stuff but it did for martha i don't know how it happened but martha set off the pace for the rest of us to say we can't look behind excuses there is no excuse for us to stay in the situation we're in now. So look at the line of witnesses that have gone before us. Read, study, look at how other people made it and try to fit, mark a plan for you to make it for yourself. So Martha hey. set that tone for us. Auntie Martha, I love you Auntie Martha. May she rest in peace. Auntie Martha Ann. Uh, Auntie Mary says she's waiting for the book. Uh, Auntie Jolanda said another book she can't wait. Oh, uh, my Auntie Beck, uh, your, your sister Beck is on. Hey, Auntie Beck from Rochester, New York. All right, so um, I'm going to take a pause for a second. I'm not going to leave, but I just want to let everyone know that's on right now. This is the book that we're talking about, the one presently, I'm Too Old for That, by Pastor V. Wilson, PhD. It's available at Amazon.com. Uh, but I'm going to I'm going to keep going through the book because there's a lot of more stuff in here, y'all. It's a lot more juicy stuff in here. So now we're going to go to the next chapter, and uh, we and we spoke a little bit about picked out to be picked on. Uh, now we're going to talk about too old for wear. That's the next chapter. Too old for wear. So she, she she has in one of her chapters. It is so important to go where God leads you, wherever He sends you. He will go before you and prepare the way. Some of y'all out there trying to walk blind. <laughs> Some of y'all trying to go out there and you want to do it on your own. That's not it. You have to go where God leads you. He's going to prepare the way for you. Now you have to use that faith that we were talking about earlier. And you got to walk out on that faith and trust and believe that what God has for you is for you. She also says your where may be in your own home. Mm -hmm. We're going to say that again, and we're going to pause for three seconds so y'all can let that sink. Your where may be in your own home. Where y'all going? Where you going? You're where you're supposed to be. You're at the place that God has for you. So now you need to operate. You need to operate 
in his will. You may only need to serve your family. Charity begins at home and then spreads abroad. <laughs> I can almost read this whole chapter, but I cannot do that because I want y'all to get this book for yourself. And I want you to do your own research. Job. He talks about Job. It's where Job was attacked. So many ways, his, his wife, his children, his cattle, it was attacked, but his where was at home. Come on, Dr. B. Let me talk a little bit about the where. Now, and I'm just going to give you a little blurb about it just to add to what's in the book. When I realized that my where was in the home was right at the cusp of my getting ready to go through divorce. And I became a, a, a single parent at home. And I realized that everything my children needed, God must have intended for it to be with me. So I could not drop the mantle and let them just do what they needed to do. Um, at that time, I had not received all of my degrees, but I had children who were in college and they were going about their degrees and, and doing that. And I said, I, I have to complete these degrees because I don't want them to have an excuse. I don't want them to say it can't be done. So I had to just, you know, forget about all of the heartaches and headaches and pains and go and get it done. And then I continued to go on because I didn't want them. I have five sons, five sons, and sons are supposed to be heads of the house. And I, and I know that a bachelor's degree was not going to be where they need to be all the time. That was their where. They had to go farther than the bachelor's degree. So I had to go further to show them that they can get there. Okay, so after I went to that master's degree, uh, I immediately start even looking for colleges for my sons to go at that time. My daughter was uh, still, you know, in, in, at home, uh, looking for places for them to go to make sure that they go to that next level of getting the master's degree so that their finances can be enhanced and they'll be able to be the husbands that they need to be for their wives. And after I got the first master's degree and when I got the second master's degree, I realized that I was still working because God had then blessed me uh, with some additional children. I adopted three more. So I had some other uh, uh, role maps to make uh, and, and keep doing it. And then I went for the, the, the PhD, which we're going to talk a little bit about more, but I had to show them that there were more to education than the master's degree. Reach on over and get a PhD that's going to work for you. Um, become a professional in your field. Uh, be a master of your craft. Uh, do the best that you can with what you have. Even as a secretary, I was the best secretary. I have many awards for that. Whatever you whatever you are, whatever your where is, do the best that you can there. Don't do mediocre things because people will look at you as, as a nothing or a nobody, but be the best in whatever it is. Wear the crown. I even got the best parent award from one church, one child because of the sacrifices that I made to make certain that my children had what they needed to be successful in their own life. So my where started in the home at that point. And, and that's when I really, I think I fell in love with my children all over again, because I realized that my investment, they, I, I was told when they were laughing at me about having children after each other, one after the other, oh, why are you having all those children? It was an investment. And, my, and now I'm re reaping the rewards of that investment. So I started investing all of my time into them, my time and my treasure, and just began to share with them what I needed them to do in life, encouraging them to never give up, encouraging them to always look to the hills because my dad had a saying just behind the cloud is sunshine. And so I carried that saying on to my children. Don't look at where you are now. Look at where you're going because this is just a little pit in the road to get you to where you need to be. So that's your where. Start where your where started. You. You and, now my, and now my where can take me all the way to the White House. It can because I mean that little... What you just said just then, that just, oh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the, the Facebook messages that were going on as you were saying that. And Auntie Marion said, Dr. Victoria's vivacious Vivian, you set the pace. Um, Danielle Harris said, I needed to hear this. Barbara Carlyer said, you are amazing, Pastor. Oh, uh, Cousin Ebony who just graduated today, congratulations, Cuzzo. She said, always choose your own path. So you right right, right now, what, what, what you're doing is, I, I, I feel that you already, people don't even have the book yet. 
and you're already kickstarting some of the projects that they had in mind. Now, you spoke earlier, and, and I know uh, we were going to get to this topic. I'm going to put the book down for a second. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm putting a pen on too old for win because we're going to stop. We, we're not going to go there yet. You, woo, you started this with your divorce. And the divorce took almost everybody by surprise. I know it took me as your son. I'm a mama's boy to the end. It took me by surprise. I couldn't deal with it. I couldn't help but be upset. I couldn't understand it. I couldn't understand why you were so calm. You were so collected. You kept your vision going. You didn't let it stop you. Most people, when they go through a divorce, that's depressing alone. Like that's, I mean, I, I know you may have gone through a, a little short uh, spot of depression because of it, but it didn't stop you. And not only did you go through a divorce, but your ex-husband married your close friend after divorce, not long after divorce either. I mean, he, it, it, it's, it's, to me, it seemed like it was the next day, even though I know it wasn't the next day, but it, it, he, he married your close friend. And your close friend, I remember vividly her coming to the house to counsel the two of you on your marriage and any kind of problems that it may have been facing. Let's talk about that. Wow. Um you want to know um, why I stayed focused. And I think I pretty much answered that. I had six children that I had to stay focused for. But two people that are listening today don't even realize that they were part of my recovery. And that's Marion and Ola. Uh, and Ola can appreciate me this when I say this. Um, she used to say, I told you 10th grade. And she can, she can appreciate that. I'm sure she'll make a note about that. And so she kept me laughing about that. I told you 10th grade. And uh, uh, Marion was always that solid one that uh, I knew I could call at different times. All of my sisters are very, very, very special to me. But during that particular period, those two stand out. But there was one other one. I had a mentor, and I still have that mentor, uh, Mother uh, Bernice Poe. Brother Barney's Poe was the greatest mentor that anyone could ever have in their lives. And she basically uh, incubated me during that particular period of time. But the reason it didn't shock me so much, as you know, my relationship with God has been really, really strong. Um, ever since I received the salvation at age 16, I've always kept a, a, a relationship with Christ. And before I found out about the, the, the divorce or the, the marital uh, breakup, God has shown me in a vision that uh, something was happening. And I'm thinking, and I'm telling God during that time, I said, are you going to take him? Is he going to have an accident? Because I don't believe in divorce. And I was always taught divorce is wrong. So I know I, it, I never would have thought that it was going to be a divorce, but the Lord was shown, has shown me prior to this that, that we would not be together. So I'm thinking that there's a death coming, not a divorce. So I was taken back when I found out it was a divorce because remember, and you know, we were all in church together. You were part of that, that group in church. And some of the great messages uh, that you heard during that time uh, from your father. And one of the main things that you, you, you could possibly remember is that he used to say the greatest thing that a man can do for his children is to what? Love their mother. And then you remember the song that he sung when a man walks away from his home and leaves his family all alone and his children are begging for bread. Nothing but sin is to blame for it all. I will never forget those moments because we heard them so much. So divorce was the last thing on my mind that would have ever happened to us because we're saved. We're Holy Ghost filled. We love the Lord. We speak in tongues. We go to church. We have a good time. Uh, why is anybody tiptoeing through the tulips? So that never crossed my mind as to 
a, a remote possibility that something like that could, could happen. And so, yeah, I was taken by surprise, but I was not taken by surprise enough to take me out of motherhood. I still had to be a mother. And I will never forget the day, and I'm sharing so somebody out there can hear this. The day that he walked out of the house, I was at a meeting. And I could not concentrate on that meeting that day because God kept telling me that day, get up, go and make a phone call, change your bank account. And I said, God, we have joint account. We, that's not the way I've been taught. This is our, my conversation. I could not enjoy that meeting until I got up from that, from that meeting, walked to a phone and called the bank. And I said, I need to have an individual checking account. And the person that answered the phone happened to have been, he's deceased right now, happened to be a man of God, took care of everything on the phone for me, transferred everything of mine to that account. So God was preparing me for it. And when I got home that day, he, um, he had gone, everything was out. And we had a football game that night. I was taking uh, my two younger children at that time, Jade and, our aunt and, and John, had planned to go to a Thursday night football game. And so we got home and, I, and they, when I got home from work, I said, okay, guys, your dad gone, let's go to football. Never stopped to say, we're not gonna go to football because he's gone. I'm having a pity party because you know, my feelings hurt. No, let's go to football. We got dressed, we went to the football game. We continued as if things were in order. But inside, it was like, what is it say, like dead man bones. Inside, I was hurting every word that you can think about hurting. And that was the time when I walked to my father and, and him uh, having the cancer. That was a time that I know that if I was gonna make it through this, I had to be around strong saints. I had the best children in the world, but I knew they were all hurting, every one of them, um, from the eldest to the youngest. And I, and I could see uh, the anger and the tears and, and, and everything that you all were going through. So I had to be strong. I had to, as they say, man up. But I, I did not man up by myself. I did not. Um, my father, who was the first person to give me the word that um, something was going on in my marriage, because I didn't know God had revealed it to him. And he said it to my mother, so my mother can come tell me. And here I am again, you know, we don't believe in divorce. Uh, this is not happening, whatever, whatever. But um, it did happen. Uh, and it changed me. And I, I will be, I will be a liar if I say it did not change me. It changed me in some areas for the worse, and it changed me in some areas for the best. And the area that it changed me for the worst is that I'm very, very selective of the males that I, I, I tried to even get close enough to talk to because I felt like I had the cream of the crop. I had God's man, I had a pastor. I had an elite in the neighborhood. I had a master degree holder. I had a professional person. I had the best that God had. So why should I condescend and settle for anything less. And I was not about to do that. So in that area, 20 years later, I'm still single because no one has measured up. And not to say that I'm better than anybody else or look better because um, I'm kind of like uh, Maya Angelou. I'm not that phenomenal woman. You know I, 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 you know, I am the phenomenal woman, but I'm not the phenomenal thin woman. And I may not be the phenomenal light and bright and almost white woman, but I am that phenomenal woman. So I had to realize that he was not just divorcing me, and which is what it should have happened. It should have been a divorce of me, but it seemed, seemed to have turned to a divorce of family. So I had to step in there and I had to be that shoulder that each one of you all leaned on in your respective places that you could go to uh, to find a safe place to rest and a safe place to lie down. And that's what happened. So it was, it was not easy. And I would not begin to tell you it was easy. I, I had no help from the from the church that, that I was in, that grand old Kojic church. Uh, nobody um, assisted me. I went to bishops and they got a pretty much laughed in my face. I even went to district missionaries for help and got nothing. I, I really got nothing but, uh, but Mother Poe and my two sisters that I mentioned, they stood the test of time with me during that time. And they would not let me bury my head in the sand and say, it's over. They would not do that. And, and I'm, I'm forever grateful to them. And, and we don't even, we don't talk a lot. Uh, um, we talk too much now through Marco Polo and text and, and all that kind of stuff. But so far as on the phone, we don't do a lot of talking, but, but we know we have each other's back, all four of us. There are only four of us. Uh, there are only uh, what, five of us girls left. We have each other's back and we know that. And we, we know that that's, that's, that's the, the, the plan. And I know people say, oh, you should have fought, you should have shot. No. Why give the enemy victory 
when he thought he already had it. But he didn't because the victory belongs to God. And, and so what that did and for the good, it, it allowed me the space to go and become that woman that I really wanted to be. It, it allowed me the space to go and get those other degrees, the space to go and write the books that I needed to write. It allowed me the space to be free, to be on hand for any of my children, anytime they needed me. If they needed me to come over, uh, if they needed to come over my house to stay, if whatever they needed, it afforded me that opportunity to do that. And I remember staying up many nights late helping my children out with their college papers and stuff like that. I could do that now because I don't have the obligations of making certain that I was caring for a man and making sure this, these things were in place. So yeah, it was hurtful. And, and the biggest hurt was, as you in, indicated earlier, it was a very dear friend of mine at that time. So I lost uh, some friends in that process um, uh, because there were some people who co-signed and, 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 and tried to act like that was okay um, in the church. And um, there are a lot of things that happen. Uh, I was angry. I was angry because I didn't see it coming. I did not understand. And, and, and this is not to, to, uh, to make anybody feel bad. You ask me about me. I'm telling you about me. This is not to throw shade or anything on anybody. But I felt bad that people didn't understand that that should have taken me back, that that should have taken the family back. Uh, so when I started the church that we started uh, immediately after that, Pastor Lionel Leonard uh, became uh, the leader there with me. And he, he is a gentle, gentle shepherd. He knew how to incubate not just me, but he incubated the entire family. He pulled us in and he, he, he knew our mood swings and he knew um, the things that we were going through and he knew how to shepherd us and love us and put us back to uh, a strong place in God. So we, I'm kind of indebted to him as well. And there are some other people I'm sure that I'm missing that, that really came to, to the forefront to do those things that, that needed to be done. But at that particular time, I was uh, in a place where only a few people uh, could help me. And those people stepped to the plate to get it done. Um, fortunately, before our, your father died, he did get it straight with everybody. Uh, he did call to apologize. He did um, make efforts to make certain that uh, his name was clean and that's all God requires you to do. Um, uh, so I felt better uh, after his death uh, at the time of his uh, demise, because he he really he came he stepped to the plate, and I saw God uh, really doing some things in him uh, for him to see that I messed up with my family. Uh, but God kept us, and and yeah, I, I I couldn't let you all see when I closed the bathroom doors to go in there and shed the tears. I couldn't let you all see that. I couldn't let you all hear me. I would have to talk to Mother Post sometime one, two, and three o'clock in the morning. I had to make sure everybody was asleep and away. Talk to Mother Post. This is what I'm going through, Mother Post. You need to carry me through this. Uh, this is uh, Ola. This is what I'm going through, Marion. I'm losing it. Uh, you know, I'm, 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 le I'm losing it. But I, I didn't. And God sustained me. And you know, I'm beautifully saved today. I love the Lord with all of my heart. I don't have a problem with God. I don't hate men. I always tell people the next husband I marry will be a man. I don't hate men. I don't hate him. I don't hate her uh, either. Um, but it was a hard transition. Uh, but God sustained me and saw me through it. And I'm forever grateful. So I... Uh... Uh, you just, you bless so many people with your testimony. Uh, just that testimony right there. You bless so many people. And I just want to read a few of the comments from the, from the live feed. Uh, my brother Jonathan Wilson said, I couldn't believe it. I was shocked, but you were so strong during that time. Ricardo Lewis said, in your rough spot, you still found enough to reach even deeper and inspire and encourage me. During this time, I sat in your office and soaked up the strength. Thank you for that. Um, Tanya Coppin said, you are, a, you are an amazing, beautiful woman of God. Auntie Jo Leonard said, it's not easy. Uh, Barbara Carger said, you taught me that I may not be a Coke bottle, but to be the best can of busted biscuits that can... <laughs> that <laughs> She said, you taught me that I may not be a Coke bottle, but to be the best can of busted biscuits that any man could ever eat. She also said, you did not lose friends. You lost fakers. Very, very important. Uh, Jonathan also said, you hid the tears well. Now let your smile be seen all over the world. 
Uh, Pastor Judy Mandrell said, now other women would have a great, powerful, holy woman who could help them charter water on this sea. Absolutely love and admire you. Now, I just want to talk about, uh, before I go back to the book, that testimony was beautiful. I just want to go back and, and talk about a, a couple of bullet points that you spoke about. And one of the things that you spoke about was your anger. And uh, uh, Brother Dijeron Garrett said, God did that. <laughs> and uh, I want to talk about, you know, you talked about your anger. And uh, when uh, my father moved out, I remember those days because I remember you called me. And I stayed maybe two miles from your house. And you called me and you told me some things that he said to you and me being a mama's boy and the past person that I used to be, I absorbed that anger and it came on me so strong that I remember walking over to your house and I'm going to get very transparent y'all. So you got to get ready for what I'm about to say. I walked over to your house. It was late in the night. I walked over to your house. I think I had a key to your house. I had a gun on my hip. I walked into your house. I sat on your couch. I put the gun on my lap because at that point, I didn't see anything else. I was angry. I wanted to take him out. Nobody does this to my mama. I was so upset that I sat on your chair with the gun on my lap. And I never forget him walking out of the bedroom, looking at me, looking at the gun on my lap, turning back around, walking back in the room. I got up, I walked out the house. I walked back home. That was enough. He moved out that day. That, that, just the, just the memory of the things that he said and, you know, just knowing that this is my dad and how could my dad say this to my mom when I've never, ever saw them have a fight. I've never saw them get mad at each other. Like, where is all of this coming from? And it was at this point and I think that your faith, your spirit ran out of that room in front of my dad and jumped on me and told me, you got more to live for. You got, you got a purpose in your life. You got a vision. God got me. Let God do what he's going to do. I know you're angry, but God got me. Get up, Reggie. You never said this stuff verbally, but in the spirit, get up, Reggie, and go home. You've done enough. So I just, I just really, really, I'm almost lost for words because that moment was, 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 was so crazy. And I remember walking back home and, 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 and I was so angry that I didn't even try to hide the gun on my hip. Like I walked all the way to your house with the gun showing. I walked all the way home with the gun showing. And I'm so glad that I was spared, that the police didn't get me. And it was just, I mean, the, the crazy thing about it. <laughs> if I could be as transparent as possible, the gun didn't even work. Uh, <laughs> it was just, it was a, it was a, a broken down a gun. Scare tactic. A yeah, scare it was, tactic. It was a scare tactic. And I, I guess it worked. Uh, that was a that that was powerful. That was beautiful. And, but I did talk to you. You did talk to me about that. Um, the the day the day of or the day afterward, and I told you that would never happen. You would not go to jail for this. Allow God to take it. That would never happen. Do not do that again. He is your father. He will always be your father, and that is not an option. Uh, do you recall that? Yes. And then we end up getting counseling for you instead yep. of from me. I didn't get counseling, but we got counseling for you, amen, to make certain that you kept yourself together uh, in that situation, and, and look where you are today. Yes, 
And I'd never remember, I, I'd never forget, uh, it was Natalie Freeman's dad. May exactly. He, rest in peace. Exactly. He counseled me, he counseled me a lot on FAMU's campus. And uh, Mr. Luther Wells, who was my advisor, my best friend, my director right now, I remember when he took me in his office and he stood in front of the door and he blocked the door. And he said, I know you're mad. He said, but I want you to get it all out right now. And I don't care if you got to swing on me, I'm not letting you out. Because my father worked right across the lawn. Exactly, exactly. The field department. So I could have just easily just run over there and jumped on him. And Mr. Wells stood there in front of that door and he said, I'm not going to let you out. I'm not going to let you out. And I remember crying. And I remember crying and crying. And Mr. Wells was just right there. And he was like, I got your back. And I'm forever indebted to Mr. Wells as well. Hey, you like that, Mr. Wells as well. I'm forever <laughs> indebted to him because uh, he's always been in my corner. He's still in my corner. I love you for that, Mr. Wells. All right, so we're going to, that was just a little part. Of it. I just want to talk about the divorce. I know a lot of people want to hear about that. And it's, it's powerful. You are a powerful, powerful, powerful woman. Because Let's you, say that I'm a saved woman. Yeah, I am. Yeah. I've been picked out to be picked on, uh, and 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 I, I thank God to have the testimony that I remain holy, that I remain steadfast, that I, I didn't get bitter or nasty or uh, whatever you want to call it, because God had, like I said, He had given me the warning. So when it manifested itself, I understood clearly what was going on. And my whole thought pattern at that point was, you have children that God has blessed you with, take care of them. And there are a lot of other parts about uh, the divorce that we did not talk about and how I had to lose the church and that kind of stuff. Um, um, and, and, and what people don't realize, and you all need to realize this, people are precious. Um, when I'm in something, I'm dedicated to it. I, I give you 100%. And... I had given 100% to Kojic and I had given 100% to, uh, to everything and, and all of my tithe and offering and service and, and, and you name it. And when I needed them, they weren't there. And I'm not going against Kojic because I still love Kojic. It was just those people at that particular time. And, and I mentioned about why God told me to open up an account. A lot of, this, this probably went over a lot of people's heads because they don't know anything about this. And, and, and our marriage, all of the money was controlled by uh, their dad. He was in charge of all of the finances. All of the finances went to him and his account. And he was totally in charge of everything. I just went to work. And, and, and sometime got an allowance and sometime didn't. But I went to work every day. So all of that was there. So when, when, Because that was what I was taught. The money should be in one pot. And everybody should be able to live from that one pot. Until the Lord spoke to me that day. He said, no, make it two pots. You know, let's, you, you got to do two pots because you're going to get, you're getting ready to get had. Amen. And so I, people just know that if you have a relationship with God, he will not lead you uh, into wrong things, into bad directions. God will warn you. He will warn you. You got to listen to what he says. You got to do it even when it doesn't sound right. Even when it goes contrary to what you've been taught and you know the word of God is saying it and God is saying it to you, step forward and do it because had not I done that, had not I done that, y'all hear me, had not I done that, that Thursday, my paycheck on the next day would have been going to his account and he would have been moving out that Thursday with my money. And I would not have had any way to, to live, to live financially. I wouldn't have had anything had not I listened to what God said do. Do it and do it expeditiously. So much so that he would not allow me to hear. I'm in a meeting and I could not hear anything that was going on because he was in my head saying, I need you to get up and get this done. I need you to do it now. It's very important that you do it now. You got to do it now. And I didn't understand the importance and the urgency about doing it then until later on when I realized after two o'clock, my money would have been deposited for um, the next day. And it would have been deposited in a joint account and I would have been left high and dry. And, and um, so God has a way of, of making everything well and making things all right. And let me tell you also, uh, while we're on this piece, people in the church, um, I, I, I don't recommend that you take sides because there are two sides to every story and then there's the truth. I lost dear missionaries, dear pastors um, in this situation uh, because I was being accused of everything and nobody really knew the situation. Uh, the Bible tells me a man is 
uh, tempted when he's drawn after his own lust and enticed. So I can't, you know, I, I don't, I just don't know. Uh, people didn't want to listen. They, they figured uh, I was the quiet one. I was the loud one. He was the quiet one. I was the one that's always up. He was the one that was pretty down. So they figured it had to be me. No, 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 no. I was being steadfast, unmovable always abounding in the works of the Lord as I'm doing right now. And I was consistently doing what I needed to do. Was I a perfect wife? Definitely not. Did I have flaws? Of course I had flaws. I'm so glad that God looked beyond my flaws. Um, but did I do anything to deserve that? I did not, but God, and I'm grateful. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so uh, I've been, like, like I said, I, I'm trying to watch as many comments as I can as you are doing your, uh, your testimonies. And uh, Ms. Kimberly K. Harden from, uh, from Family Center Theater, she said, Dr. Wilson, run and tell it. Uh, Charlie Field said, wow, very powerful testimony. Barbara Carter said, you taught me no bitterness or you will miss your blessing. Ricardo Lewis said, very, very powerful. Ricardo Lewis also said, your where was home that night. So we're gonna, we're gonna talk about, we're gonna talk, we're gonna go back to the book because uh, for those of you who are just joining, uh, this is the book, I'm Too Old For That by Pastor V. Wilson, PhD. I'm Too Old For That. And uh, we've already spoke about a lot of the chapters. Uh, the chapter that we're on now is Too Old For When. And it's, it's, it's important because uh, that's pretty much what we were just talking about now. Too Old For When. You say in the book, your time may not be my time. Who is to decide your when? When we remain optimistic, notwithstanding our, our, notwithstanding our waiting, God recompenses us with rehabilitated strength. Rehabilitated strength. Yes. When things, when things seem to go wrong in one area of our life, perhaps we can observe his transforming love in another area of our lives. And it renovates our confidence for another. We can soar above the exasperation and keep moving ahead of our worry as long as we continue to wait in hopeful anticipation for God to work. That's uh, good stuff. There may be times in our lives when we wish things would move along a little more rapidly. We may be in a difficult season and just want it to be over as soon as possible. Although it may seem natural to want to look ahead, we can run the risk of eliminating the things God needs us to see at the time. Remember, God's timing is always the best. <laughs> that's that's in the chapter. Uh, too old for when. Uh, you 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 just spoke about that a whole lot. I don't know if you want to say anything else about it, but the the floor is yours. But I want you all to remember also that uh, your when will be different from my when. I, I look at uh, my Reginald there, and I remember in the struggles that he has uh, uh, encountered during his. Um, acting days and you know the, they call it the starving artist. Um, I remember all of those times and I remember how he, um, Reg is a go-getter, I think he needs some Ritalin or something. Uh, he's, he's a go-getter, he's <laughs> he cannot sit still and I remember him uh, moving to uh, into New York and and really really struggling and trying to pull his family there with him and, and, and even though he was struggling, he was still trying to get them there. I and mean, I remember uh, him, you know, pulling monies together to get them to come down to look for housing and, and all of that stuff. And, and, I, and I remember, see, uh, Reg is talking about me and, 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 and the things that I put in that book. And he doesn't realize that a lot of my strength came from the things that he went through as well. Because after he had done all of that to try to get them in New York and get them to be there with them, they end, he ended up losing the entire family. And that was a big hit for him. And then struggling, I mean, struggling on the streets and that kind of stuff. And not giving up though. And I used to say, you need to come on back. Come on back. It's not happening for you. You know, we are exhausting all of our funds and everybody's sending you this, that, and the other trying to make it happen for you. And it's not happening, but he stayed the course. And he said, I, I got to see it through. Somehow or another, I got to make it happen. So you would think he had already read the book, but he was writing the book at that time. I got to make it happen. People are going to talk about you and people, and, and, and you, you mentioned that a lot too. And, uh, and I'm pretty sure I mentioned that a lot in the book too. You, you got to forget the naysayers and what they're saying because they don't know the truth. And as the movie uh, say, they can't handle the truth. 
That's why they don't know it. They can't handle it. And a lot of things you can't, can't tell people, even your closest friends. And you got to know who's in your circle. You got to know when to put people in your circle and when to take them out. Everybody is not intending to be in your circle for the rest of your life. You got to know your when. You got to know your when to move on. You got to know your when to stand still. You got to know your when to, move, to, to, to say, okay, enough is enough. You got to know your when. I, <clears throat> again, <laughs> you caught me with that one. And uh, it, it's, it's, it's so important. I remember the New York and I remember trying to get my ex and my children up there. And I remember when, you know, she came to visit and we looked for housing and things like that. And I remember uh, getting the, the notice from <clears throat> the sheriff that my ex had filed for divorce. And it was on the same day that I had got one of my biggest plays in New York. Like I was, I was on my way. I, I had just made a play called Black Angels Over Tuskegee by Leon Gray. I had just got casted for it and I was so happy. And when I got home, the sheriff was at my door with the divorce uh, papers. And it, 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 it grabbed me. It grabbed me by the juggler and just threw me all against the wall. And, and, <laughs> and, 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 and I was so, I was so, broken and I was so hurt because I thought I was doing everything right. I thought everything was going the right way. I, I remember when I was, I was supposed to graduate from the University of Florida and a week before the graduation, my ex told me she didn't want me to come back home. And I was just like, what, 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 what? And, and it's so crazy because uh, one thing that just like you, uh, you, you let people go with what they thought. And I did the same thing. And it was so hard for me to return to Tallahassee because I was hearing the naysayers. I was hearing everyone say Reggie divorced his wife after he moved to New York City. And I didn't say, no, she filed for divorce. I never said it. I was like, no, she, I didn't file for divorce. She filed for divorce. I tried everything to get them here. I'm still trying to get them here. Even as we went through the divorce for a whole year and we went through the mediation and I kept telling the mediator, I want my family and my, and my wife, I want them here. I want them here in New York because this is, this is where we're supposed to go. This is the vision. It, it, it's being fulfilled. Everything that we were prophesied, everything that we were prophesied is happening. The New York is here. Everything is here. Everything is here. But what is this divorce doing? Like, why, why, why is this divorce happening? Reggie, call the people and tell them that you didn't file the divorce. <clears throat> but I didn't. I just... I just let the divorce happen. And then when I found that I lost all of my children, that's when I was almost at the point of no return. That's when I was so depressed. That's when the depression hit me the, the, the hardest because I understood the fact that my ex probably didn't want to be in a marriage anymore. But after finding out that uh, she went for the custody of all the children and she got it, uh, that, that pretty much destroyed me. And I stayed away from, I stayed away from Tallahassee for about a year or two after that happened because I was so afraid of what the people would say to me. I was so afraid of the judgments that I would get, that I was getting. But then I came to realize that I, I, I needed to be in New York because doors started to open up. Doors and more doors started opening up. So I would pray and God would show me, I got you. I got you. Let me show you something. I'm going to show you things that don't normally happen. I'm going to show you. I'm going to put you in the New York Times after being in New York for five months. I'm going to put you in the New York Times. A year later, I'm going to get you a Best Lead Actor Award. Things that's not happening. Then I'm going to put you in the New York Times again. I'm going to get you another award and another award. I'm going to catapult you as long as you keep the faith. And that's what I did. I kept the faith. I kept the faith. But I will say, uh, that thing was hard. It was hard and I, that was my win that was that, that that was the win that's when i really had to lean and depend on god because i didn't have any family in new york none nobody i had knew no one i mean i had my auntie all the way in rochester but i was right there in, Man in manhattan in the city and it was hard and there were the times that i was hungry and i didn't have no food and i remember calling mama and i was just and, and i remember calling mama and say i'm mad about this i'm mad about that i'm mad i'm mad and she would say to me very calmly i'm sending you some money go get something to eat she knew 
She knew that the real hunger, she knew that the real anger was coming from the fact that I didn't have the money to eat. I didn't have the way because I was trying so hard to become successful as an actor that I was putting everything else to the side. Uh, my Auntie Marion, the same thing. Auntie Marion would send me, would send me gifts beyond gifts and, I, and, and I'm forever indebted to her as well. Uh, my, my, my studio right now that's, that's on the way, like my Auntie Jolinda, like she came through. She was the first person to say, I'm gonna put a down payment on your dream. My, my cousin, Ebony, she called me, she said, you know what, how much have you, how much have you gotten donations so far? I got the rest. And she sent me the receipt. Y'all, I haven't worked in two months. I haven't. Two months today, today, May 15th. I haven't worked since March 15th. I left, I left Portland after doing that play. After doing that play, I came to New York. I came back to Florida. And that's when the lockdown started. And there was nothing for me. But I'm still surviving. I'm still eating. And I just really, really thank my mother. Thank my brother, Jonathan Wilson. Thank my brother, Jeremy Wilson. John Wilson, my sister, Jay Smith. My brother, uh, Raymond Wilson. Because they all said, Reggie, we know your dream. We know what you're going through. We've seen this before. <laughs> It, this might be new to everybody else, but you've been here. You've been this starving actor before. We know this very well. You ain't got to call us with no, with, with no story. No, y'all, I just lost my rent last week trying to make sure I do this. We know what's going on, and they looked out for me. I'm, I love them for that. So that was my testimony. Uh, I, I, I love, I, I love, I love, I love everyone for uh, still being in. Um, Auntie Rebecca said, a good mother can read her children's mind. And that is the truth. <laughs> and uh, John, my little brother John is on the line from, from California. And we will, he, I just got his book in the mail on yesterday. And we will be having a one-on-one -on -one discussion with him as well. But we're going to keep going along. Thank everyone for, for, for staying there with us. Uh, now we're going to get to the juicy, 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 juicy part of the book. I'm too old for that. That's what the name of the book is. So when, we, when she gets to I'm too old for that, that's, that pretty much uh, takes all of everything that she's been writing and it puts it all into that chapter, but she breaks the chapter down into subtitles. So she, she, she has a poem that she wrote, spoken word. I want to say spoken word. It's not a real poem. It's a spoken word that she wrote. And it's called The Dream Killer. I'm going to read a little bit of it, but I can't read it all because I want y'all to go and get the book. They want to kill your dream, lower your esteem, make you cry and wonder why. Did I allow them in my circle anyway? Will they stop you in your track, make you look back, cause you to slack and like a duck quack quack? Because when I pause, I miss the claws that say move on up, never disrupt. The progress being made, the bridges being laid, the inner forces that say the dream killer is here. Don't you fear? The tactic is near, Leah, distraction of your plan to move again to the place that's not made by man. Hold your head high, like an eagle you can fly over the killer's head into victory instead, to a place you would not dread. Like the eagle, you need space to erase the embrace of the killer's pace and say, in your face. <laughs> it's a lot more to the form. It's a lot more, it's a lot more, it's a lot more. But I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna read anymore. That's, that's very important. Like that, 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 part of the, that part of the spoken word piece, it, that if, you, if you're feeling low, print this out. Print this out. Put it in a frame. Put it on your front door. Put it on your bathroom mirror. Get you just a little saying that say the dream killer because eventually you're going to memorize this spoken word. And every time you start to have those doubts, every time you start giving up on yourself, you're going to remember the dream killer. Don't allow your dreams to be killed. That's the introduction into the meat of this book. I'm too old for that. And she goes to all of her bullet points. I was about to read some to y'all, but y'all gotta read y'all gotta read that to yourself because she talks to the younger women and she speaks to the younger women about what she went through and how she was able to motivate herself through. She also says, with the hardships placed on me as a double minority. See, this is for all y'all, all y'all young black women. With the hardships placed on me as a double minority, I have transcended the barriers of despair 
I have walked over bridges of hope. I have built bridges of, of excellence, bridges of preparation, bridges of faith, bridges of love, bridges of coalition, and bridges of cooperation. Therefore, I'm too old for mediocrity. <laughs> you want to talk about that, Dr. B? Uh, you know what? Uh, <laughs> I'm enjoying you. You're doing a great job, uh, Reggie. You're doing an absolutely great job. And I know that the time is far spent and, and it's almost time to go, but you're, you're doing a superb job in that um, we really got to step over mediocrity. Uh, we just got to stop doing little small things, stop doing small stuff. Uh, we, we, are, we, we, we are capable of doing great things. We are capable of building bridges that everybody can cross over. It's just not a bridge that I need to cross over, but it's a bridge that 10 of you all need to cross over behind me. Not just me. I need Raymond to cross over that same bridge. I need Jonathan. I need Reginald. I need Jeremy. I need John, Jay, Jamelia, Janina, uh, Jayla. And I need Josiah and all of my grandchildren to cross over that same bridge. So I got to build a strong bridge, not one that's going to, you're going to get in the middle of the bridge and, and, and drown. I need to build a bridge strong enough to pull all of you across. And is that a hard job? Yes, it is. But is it a worthy job? Most definitely. Because you all are my greatest assets and I live for you. And, and you guys keep me living and it's an awesome thing. But so build bridges. Stop being mediocre. Stop saying that's too hard. I can't do that. Um, I tell my kids that they, the difference with can and can't is that lazy tea. We got to get that laser T out of the way because we can. And, and, and one of uh, a, a Sergeant Major, uh, taught me about that laser T. And it, but one thing that he said, Sergeant Schultz said, he said, please love you some you. So one of my things, I love me some me. And I love me some me so much that I know how to love you. And, and, and those that are coming behind me, build a bridge that they'll be able to cross. I don't want you all to falter in your, your progresses. I want you all to make it all the way to the top. And I want to be the example to show you how to get there. Uh, so I'm always, it, it, I was uh, on the Zoom the other night and I was a little tired and I was kind of sleeping a little bit, kind of dozing off. And a question was asked and I got up and I gave an answer so alive and so alert. And my daughter Jane said, how did you do that? <laughs> how were you able to come back so alert? And I know you were snoozing. And I said, something that you grow to. I could have got to say, oh, I just woke up. But no, she said, you came up with a powerful response as if you were not tired, as if, you know. And I say, there's something you have to practice. You, if you practice always making excuses, guess what? You'll have an excuse for every time. Mm -hmm. You got to practice always saying, I can get up from this. This is not going to get me. I'm going to rise above the occasion. I got to make this happen. These are on. Uh, Brother these are on said, come on. Get rid of the lazy tea. That's so important, y'all. The only thing that's stopping a can and a can't is that lazy tea. Get rid of that lazy tea. Uh, just like uh, uh, Dr. V say, time is getting a little short. So I, what I'm going to do now is uh, I'm going to just read you her top 10 too old for that. We're not going to go into it. I'm just going to read them to you. So you can get the book and you can read the breakdown of the top 10 too old for that. Number 10. Too old to wait on your procrastinating and cheating hard. <laughs> Number nine, I'm too old for building other people's visions. I have to say that one more time. Number nine, I'm too old for building other people's visions. Indeed. Number eight, I'm too old for mediocrity and half-hearted work. Number seven, I'm too old for spending quality time with useless people. Number six, I'm too old to worry about how others think I look. A lot of us are stuck in that one, even myself. Number six, I'm too old to worry about how others think I look. Number five, I'm too old to take care of grown children and slothful men. She, she, she told us that a lot. Listen, that slothful part. You, you're not going to be lazy around my mother. She's not going to have it. You can be lazy as you want to, but you're not going to get nothing. You're not going to get nothing but motivation to get off your butts and stop being lazy. That's why she just said, get off that lazy teeth. Number four, I'm too old to be insecure. Daryl Jones said, Dr. Wilson, you are forever amazing. <laughs> Number three, I'm too old for backlash and beatings after I've apologized for causing you harm. Y'all gotta hear that one because a lot of us are suffering that. 
I'm too old for backlash and beatings after I've apologized for causing you harm. Number two, I'm too old for the LGBT, lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans transgender group to infer that their rights make my religious belief wrong. Step on it. Number one, number one, I'm too old to watch a sinner plan and orchestrate his path to hell. That's what all of us doing. We, 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 well, not all of us, but some of us are watching. Some of us are letting people self-destruct when we might have the tools that they need, which may just be a rub on the back, may just be a, 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 nice, a, a nice word of encouragement. Stop watching these people orchestrate their self to hell. And I'm going to go back to number three because I see y'all asking for number three again. <laughs> I'm too old for backlash and beatings after I've apologized for causing you harm. And then you want number one again. Okay, 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 I see ya. I see, you want number one and two. See, y'all gonna have to get the book. That's what, <laughs> that's, that's, that's what that's showing. Y'all gonna have to get the book. I'm too old to watch a sinner plan and orchestrate his path to hell. So that's the book, y'all. That's the book, at the end of the book, she has her sheroes and her heroes. She has Harriet Tubman and Sojourner Truth. She has her parents, Dr. J.O. Wright and, and, and Annie Ree Wright. She got Dr. Dr. Dorothy K. Richardson, Mother Bernice Poe, uh, my, her, my oldest aunt, Martha Wright Stanley, uh, Elder Liner Leonard. She has uh, Mrs. Marion Wright Gidry and Bishop Charles Harrison Mason. Y'all, that's the book. That's the book right there. That is the book. You get the book on Amazon.com. Uh, you may have to put the title in, I'm Too Old for That. Or you might have to just put her name in, Pastor V. Wilson, PhD. So the next time, I just want y'all to know, we didn't do it this time, but we discussed it. The next time that we do a one-on-one -on -one with, her, with her new book, um, Prayers for the... Uh, Prayers and Nuggets for the Hurting Woman 2, the domestic violence video, she will be giving out autographed copies. She's going to be giving out autographed copies uh, on, on the next one. So we want to thank you all for all that you've done. If, uh, if, you, if you know her. Okay, we see that Barbara Collier has put in the comments the link to go get the book. I've, I went straight through the book. I didn't beat around the bush, and y'all saw she didn't read about it. She didn't beat around the bush either. She touched on it all. It's an easy read. I read it twice, and now I'm studying it for the third time. It's called I'm Too Old for That. So we have to stop making up excuses of why we're not going back to school to get that bachelor's degree, why we're not going back to school to get that master's degree, why we're not going back to school to get that PhD. We got to stop making excuses. Pastor D, Pastor V. Wilson has already shown us that it's possible. We didn't talk about the fact that at the age of 59 years old, she got her PhD. At the age of 59, some of us ain't even 40 yet. And we said we're too old. No, you're not. Too old for what? You're not too old for nothing. Pastor Vivian Wilson also has a ministry in Quincy, Florida, Innovative Agape Ministries. That's what my production company is up under, Faith Steps Productions. Also, my little brother has a ministry in Lehigh, in Fort Myers, Florida, which is Power of God Global Ministries. That's also under Dr. V. Wilson's ministry. So if you need some help, if you need some words of encouragement, Dr. V. Wilson is where to go. If you want to, if you, if you want to uh, give a donation to her ministry, her her cash app is said for me, uh, Dr. B. It's Wilson. Dollar sign I am ministry two. Dollar sign I am ministry two. Dollar sign I A M M I N I S T R Y two. That's the numerical number two. Don't spell out two. That's her ministry. If you want to give to her ministry, go ahead. Uh, uh, we we love the fact that she's she's doing all these books. And, and, and we want you to go out and get the book. It's on Amazon.com right now. Thank you all for tuning in. That was Sipping Tea with Dr. V. 
We're going to let Dr. V uh, finish us out with any kind of encouraging words that she wants to give. And we're going to ask her to render us up a word of prayer. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us in this live broadcast today. Uh, I appreciate um, the CEO of Faith Steps Productions putting this on. This is uh, ab ex absolutely excellent. The one thing that we did not cover is prior to my uh, enrolling for my PhD, I had a brain tumor. Um, that I had to have brain tumor surgery for um, that um, rendered me uh, with seizures. I was having seizures and um, uh, all of this. And, and the doctors found out that the, the root of the seizures was a brain tumor and that I will be taking medicine the rest of my life or else I will be having seizures. Uh, so uh, I'm too old for that. Okay. I went to God and told God, did you hear what that doctor said? He said, I have to take this medicine for the rest of my life. The devil is a liar. Amen. I took the medicine for a month. That was in 2001, the year that one of my grandsons were born. I have not had a seizure since. God is able to deliver and he delivers on time. And it was after that that I say, God, to prove that I still have the intellect. I want to go and apply for the PhD program. And I want you all to know that I graduated from there also with honors because God did it. And now I own uh, the publishing right for my dissertation and uh, the right to publish any book. But you can publish any book you want to anyway. But I feel a little bit more secure in that um, I can write it with credentials and with the uh, authenticity. God has been good to us and he has blessed us this day. Father, right now, as we pray to bring this to a closure, we ask that you remember those that are listening to us today and that you open up areas and avenues that they can walk into God and see their dreams come to reality. That it just doesn't have to be something that they thought about or they dreamed about, but God, it can actually take feet and walk. And so we ask that you right now, that you give them the the the, the, the zeal and the desire to move forward with that that you have placed on their hands, God, knowing that there's nothing nowhere too hard for you to do, God. And I, was, I, I ask, I decree right now that you bless them, oh God. There are many books out there among those that are listening to me today. God calls those books to come to fruition in the name of Jesus. And while you're at it, God, while you're pouring out your blessing in this season, don't forget Faith Steps Production, oh God, in the name of Jesus, their CEO, God, in the name of Jesus, who's working a path, trying to meet to do those things that you will have him to do. And just like Tyler Perry, God, started in the back of his car, or wherever he started with nickels and dimes, oh God, calls his ministry to rise to the occasion for with wherewith you have appointed it to do. And God, we bless everyone who has been affected by this ministry by any way. And God, if we said anything to offend anyone that was incorrect, Oh God, we ask that you reveal it so that we can apologize because you won't reveal what you won't heal. But oh God, we are doing everything that we are doing to the glory and honor of you. So we're asking right now that you continue to work your work in our lives, God, that you continue, oh God, to have us to call to build bridges to get people to the place that they need to be in this life because truly we are too old for that. God bless you. Thank you. Amen. Thank you all for joining. Thank you all for, for your kind words. Uh, thank you, Mom. Thank you, Mom, for just being Mom. Thank you for uh, the encouragement. And uh, if, you have, if you have a book that you want to discuss, uh, please send me the link. Please DM it to me. Uh, you can send it to my email address. My email address is one, the numerical number one, Reggie Lee at gmail.com. Send me your link. We will, I will read the book, and if, if I deem it necessary, we will discuss it uh, live on Facebook. Uh, thank you, Mom, for giving us your time, your energy, your testimony. You have helped us greatly. I'm looking at all of the, all of the things that the viewers are saying. Uh, we, if, you didn't, if you did not catch the entire interview, I will be uploading the YouTube link to the video. I have to download it to my computer. It should take about an hour or two. And I'm going to upload it to YouTube and I'm going to share it on Faith Steps Productions page. So make sure that you are, if you, if you have someone who needs to see it, if you, if you just want to see it again yourself, which is myself, you can uh, come to Faith Steps Productions Facebook page. 
We're going to say goodbye to all of you, and we love you. See you later.